Coming up on this special edition of Falmouth in Focus, we take a look back at 2019 by sharing with you some of our favorite stories from the past year. Hello and welcome to this special edition of Falmouth in Focus, FCTV's current affairs program. I'm your host, Michael Kasparian. 2019 was a fascinating year in Falmouth, and we brought you some of the important people, places, and events that shaped our town. The Cape Cod Regional Transit Authority unveiled their new trolley in June of this year, and FCTV met with Tom Cahir, the CCRTA administrator, to find out about their new addition to the fleet. Uh, Tom Kerr and I'm the administrator for the Cape Cod Regional Transit Authority. So for over 25 years, uh, the Cape Cod Regional Transit Authority has provided summer trolley service to the community of Falmouth. It's called the Wush Trolley and it starts at the Falmouth Mall and it goes down through Main Street and eventually gets to Woods Hole. And it's been a very successful and popular service here in the town of Falmouth. And we've watched it over the years and monitored it closely. Ridership has been great. Um, a lot of people take it to go down Main Street and use the business community, but many use it to go down to Woods Hole to work. And so um, over the last few years, our, our mobility manager and others at, at CCRTA felt, you know, would it make sense for us to invest in a, in a trolley because we, it's the only part of what we do that we actually farmed out that service to a private vendor. We felt that if we owned the vehicle and our drivers were on, uh, on those trolleys, would be really emphasizing customer service, be more savvy as to how to work the community, work in the community. And so we made a significant investment in five new trolleys. Um, some are being used in Barnstable and two will be here in Falmouth and ultimately probably in Bourne and Provincetown as well. But today we're unveiling the brand new trolley that we have here, which is very, very pretty very aesthetically pleasing in the community. And um, it will be running uh, starting this weekend um, down to Woods Hole throughout the summer. And uh, it's gonna be running on the half hour, coming down Main Street and then ultimately to Woods Hole. But a new feature that we have, our Sea Line fixed route service that comes from Hyannis to Woods Hole all year round on the hour. Um, that service will still be intact but when it gets to the Falmouth Mall, instead of coming down Main Street, it will go down Jones Road so that we're able to use the courthouse, the hospital, Bramblebush, and some of those facilities that heretofore would not be uh, are easily able to access with public transportation. And the sea line will then continue on down to um, Woods Hall. So it's kind of an exciting day for us at the RTA to be able to announce to Falmouth that we're actually expanding service here and we're going to be doing it very professionally and uh, with customer service being the emphasis throughout. The new Woosh Trolley ran a daily route from the Falmouth Bus Depot to the Falmouth Mall to Woods Hole and back throughout the summer. One of the most important series of stories that Falmouth and Focus featured in 2019 was the coverage of the construction of the new Senior Center, a facility that will benefit all of Falmouth's residents. Let's take a look at the summary of the construction progress throughout the year. Hi, I'm Jim Vieira and I'm the chairman of the Senior Center Building Committee. And uh, we're here at our new Senior Center on Main Street. And we are in the final stages of construction. Uh, today we're standing in the wellness room. We've got our floor down, our ceilings are about done. The painters are here painting out in the hallway. And uh, with those final stages are, are, are what's going to be the concentration over the next few weeks. Uh, last week we had all of our kitchen equipment come in and uh, the, um, all the flooring in the kitchen is done and most of the flooring throughout the building is now complete. So really we're at those, those final uh, stages and we'll be doing punch list and, and all of the little, um, little tidbits that come in at, always at the end of the projects. So it's been a long process but we are uh, now towards the end of October and really into our final stages. 
We started this project actually in April of 2013, and so it's been a long process. And our construction started just about a year ago, around Thanksgiving of 2018, and now we're nearing completion. Our building here is everything that we wanted. It, it gives us the adequate space that we need for our programs that we have now, all of our future programs that we're planning, and we couldn't be happier with the, with the building itself. Uh, we think that the location here in downtown Falmouth is going to work out for us uh, in close proximity to the Gus Canty Recreation Center next door and really accessible to everything in Falmouth. So we are delighted to be here and we're also delighted that it's at the end of this very long process. One of the focuses of the building here in our new building is we're going to have so many more spaces for active exercise and active programs. Uh, in our old building, we're really limited with one large room and a couple of very small rooms. In this building, we're going to have the opportunity to have several programs all going on at once. Uh, the, the room that we're in now, as I mentioned, is the wellness room where we're going to have fitness equipment, uh, treadmills and the like. Uh, next door is a program room with, with, gonna have a, with mirrors and a ballet bar for Tai Chi and exercise uh, classes. Next to that is a room with a sink and cabinets for arts and crafts type activities. And we have a conference room and we have um, individual offices for counseling and that's all just on this second floor. Uh, so you can see we have probably twice as much room on this floor as we did in the whole building, in our whole old building. So we're, we're, it really is amazing. You know, when we talk about the people that have been involved in this project, it's a tremendously long list. We've had different committees throughout. We had an assessment group that looked at if we needed a building and how we needed it and what we needed. We had a group to help us pick out uh, the site. We had a group that evaluated our programs and how much space we were going to need. Then we have the building committee that's still active now. The Council on Aging has been involved in it. It really has been you know, dozens and dozens of people. And right now, in the construction period, you know, the town administration has been really active. Our finance director, our town manager, our assistant town manager, have all been involved in the daily activities here. Uh, you know, we've been very fortunate to have um, the friends of the Falmouth Senior Center that have been fundraising for this new building and for our programs for years and their, their funding has really come in handy in getting all the little extras that are going to make this building special. And just recently we've had the Falmouth Road Race uh, donate a significant amount of money for the Wellness Center, this room where we're, they were going to be purchasing equipment with their funds. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, there are far more people than I could ever thank. The new Senior Center staff hopes to welcome Falmouth residents to its new facility early this year. We're going to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll be looking at some of our favorite stories featuring the Falmouth Public Schools. Stay with us. When the old woman, Lois, answered the door, the first thing she said was, let me turn down my best friend. She was referring to the television set that was playing loudly across the room. As the director of Neighborhood Falmouth, I meet with all prospective members in their homes, and I was here to learn about her. I asked her how she thought Neighborhood Falmouth might help. She said, I'm 84 years old. All of my friends are dead. I don't drive anymore. I barely go out. I'm so lonesome I could die. My breath caught and I told her Neighborhood Falmouth could help. Neighborhood Falmouth is the terrific local organization that is helping seniors with transportation, light home maintenance, and social connection. Right now, there is a six month wait to become a member because we can only grow our membership when we enlist more volunteers. People like you who enjoy driving, making friends, and who believe in paying it forward. Call us to learn more about volunteering or membership or visit our website at neighborhoodfalmouth.org. And thanks. Welcome back. On August 27th, Falmouth Public School staff celebrated not only the start of the 2019-2020 school year, but also the official opening of the Falmouth High School multi-purpose field. With many student athletes, 
marching band, and town dignitaries on hand, it was standing room only for this historic occasion. On April 24, 2012, a working group was formed to discuss the need for a multi-purpose field at Falmouth High School. On September 26, 2014, the school committee voted to enthusiastically and wholeheartedly support the citizens group for the field. On April 10, 2018, Article 18 was passed at town meeting to appropriate funds for the purpose of an all-purpose athletic field at Falmouth High School. Today, August 26th, uh, 27th, sorry about that, August 27th, <laughs> um, 2019, four superintendents later, I would like to celebrate the completion of the Falmouth High School all-purpose field. This extraordinary project has represented a partnership between the town and the school department, resulting in a state-of-the-art athletic field complex to serve the primary recreational needs of the Falmouth schools as well as the Falmouth recreational community. Never, never played on turf. Played on some beautiful grass fields, played on some not so good grass fields, and played in a couple mud bowls, probably more bun bowls than I've ever thought anybody could play on. So when I came here this morning, and I've been up here a few times looking at the turf, I walked around a little bit, kid in the candy store, the ex-football coach, the ex-football player, walking around. I felt like less miles, and some of you people will appreciate that and follow football, that I wanted to actually reach down, pick up a blade of grass, and put it in my mouth. I thought, this is really neat. Uh, this is a special day for Falmouth. This is a special day for everybody involved with the task at hand, and that was getting this complex going. From the committee who did, I think, a remarkable job of, of looking at every aspect of what this could be and all the concerns about what could occur with athletes. Everything was done, I think, prime time, efficiently, effectively, a tremendous experience by everybody involved. Obviously, the administration, the field committee, the school committee, the selectmen, the community, the town meeting members, giving us the ability to put it on the ballot, and obviously the voters. Outstanding efforts by many people. The bottom line, it is built for students. It is built for athletes. It is built for the band. It is built for anybody in the community who wants to use this. This is a community endeavor. I think everybody's going to appreciate this. Enjoy your experience. This is your turf, this is your house, this is your teams, this is your stadium. As the saying goes, all good things really are worth waiting for. With that, I will close with the last three lines of the Falmouth High School School song, which aptly summarizes the blood, sweat, tears, and years that have gone into making this field a reality. Here's to their performance, never say die, bring home a victory to Falmouth High. Go Clippers! <laughs>the Clippers football, boys and girls soccer, boys and girls lacrosse, and field hockey teams all called the new field home this season. This past spring, students at the Morse Pond School participated in a charity fundraiser to benefit people without access to clean drinking water. Let's take a look back at their Walk for Water. The Walk to Water is a fundraiser that our sixth graders do here at Morse Pond. It raises money for Concordia School now, um, which is a school in Mombasa, Kenya, which I visited last summer. We started this fundraiser because it's an offshoot of the novel that the kids read, A Long Walk for Water, which includes a story of a lost boy from Kenya and a Sudanese girl who are walking for water, who has to walk every day for water <laughs> for her family. So this emulates it, the walk, and it, it teaches our students about global citizenships. And we've been very lucky to raise lots of money. We've built boreholes for the school. We've put in bathrooms in with, so that they can have clean water. And we've made an impact on what those students get every day for education. Well, we were raising, we were raising money for throughout the whole week for them and then we're doing this to simulate what people have to go through there in their long walk to water 
every day, forward and back. It was really fun because there's a tons of kids doing it and all for the people in Africa. Watching the kids do the walk for water this morning and participating with them was just such a wonderful experience. It really helps the kids have an understanding of what it means to have empathy for the folks that were in Africa that didn't have the water. And what we've been able to do to bring water to those communities through this effort is, is phenomenal. I think the thing that kids really don't realize is, is the struggle that a lot of people face around the world. And this is one little bit of insight that they can glean through their reading and then actually through this experience. It was, it was wonderful to be able to participate. The event raised more than $4,700 to benefit the Concordia School in Kenya. After this short break, we'll look back at the ribbon cutting ceremony here at the new Falmouth Community Media Center, as well as other important Falmouth and Focus stories from 2019. Stay with us. What's happening at Knobska Lighthouse? Well, in 2014, the Friends of Knobska Light was formed to maintain and revitalize the Lighthouse and Keeper's House. With donations from the community and the support of the Falmouth Community Preservation Fund, in 2017 and 2018, the Friends of Knobska Light did a full restoration of the Lighthouse Tower. Now with this and additional support, it is time to turn to the Keeper's House which will become the Knobska Lighthouse Maritime Museum. Over the last three years, the Friends of Knobska Light's board, staff, and volunteers have been working with Brown, Lindquist, Fenuccio, and Raber architects to develop plans to repurpose the Keeper's House into the museum. Together, this team selected Delbrook JKS as the construction management firm who brings both professional expertise and a deep local connection to the project. The museum will feature rotating collections, interactive exhibits, and educational programming focused on maritime history, science, literature, and art. The Friends of Knobska Light made the decision to move forward this year with a phased approach for construction. Phasing allows for immediate work on the exterior shell and structural reinforcement to the Keeper's House. This is a priority because the house is in dire need of repair. Phase one work includes replacing the roof, windows and siding, as well as repointing the chimneys, structural reinforcement, and upgrades to allow for better public access. This work will ensure the keeper's house is weather tight. Once done, the house will look much as it always has, but in much better condition. With help from you, our community, the Friends of Knobska Light will then continue on to phase two of the construction, the interior and site work. Find out more at friendsofnopska.org. Welcome back to our 2019 Year in Review. After years of planning and preparation and months of construction and moving, FCTV held the historic grand opening of the brand new Falmouth Community Media Center in July, cutting the ribbon to officially open the facility to the public. The new media center is a major expansion on FCTV's former facility, offering more space for studio programs, post-production, animation work, artists' galleries, workforce development, and many more programs and services. At the event, the public was offered tours of the media center while noted local chefs Bobby Jarvis, Gail Blakely, and Troy Clarkson provided cooking demonstrations in the new Studio A kitchen. So good afternoon and thank you for joining us for the grand opening of the Falmouth Community Media Center. My name is Deborah Rogers. I'm the CEO. This facility stands as, as a testament that here in Falmouth, we value our collective history and the unique stories that make up the fabric of our community. That we understand that democracy flourishes when people are active participants in their government, educated as literate and critical thinkers who are not only consumers of media, but have the knowledge, tools, and means to use media to express themselves. This facility stands as a testament that in our community, there's a place where media belongs to all of our citizens. Thank you to everyone who emboldened us to move from a one room, second floor facility to a media center that empowers our citizens to develop and access 21st century communication tools. Thank you to our members, board of directors, advisory committee, staff, board of selectmen, uh, our town manager, elected officials, donors, large and small, and a special thanks to Falmouth Road Race and Jeff Nickerson, who I th thought was going to be here, but not yet, 
and Decrane Appliance, Bayside Kitchen and Bath, Waypoint, Duffany Builders, David Rogers Electric, and Eastman's Hardware. Thank you to our building committee, led by Mike Duffany, architect Jeff Metcalf, owner's representative John Scanlon, general contractor Delbrook JKS, our Falmouth Chamber of Commerce, and our lender, Martha's Vineyard Savings Bank. A special thanks to Rita Pacheco and our development committee for helping to organize this event, and our guest chefs using our studio kitchen for the first time today, Bobby Jarvis, Gail Blakely, and Troy Clarkson. We hope this will be the first of many times that we all gather together in this, your center. Thank you to everyone who believed in our mission and has stood with us since our founding in 1992. At this time, I'd like to turn this over to our board treasurer, Michael Feingold. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I hope you'll enjoy the new facility as much as we do. I'll do a countdown. <laughs> Three, two, one. We're open! Wow, it was a great event for the community, the, uh, the opening of the Falmouth Community Media Center. I mean, amazing for everybody. A lot of people in attendance at 4 o'clock. The ribbon cutting went well. And of course, uh, the weather could not have been any better. This has just been such an awesome office opening. The place is huge, there's cooking shows going on, and it's a real testament to the work of FCTV to make an incredibly beautiful space for this entire community. It's a great facility, and, and we're really expanding in the capability of what we can do at FCTV. So we'd like to all have you come down and take a look at it. And, uh, uh, and see, and see what uh, your interests are and how we can meet those interests. It's very exciting. It's an amazing space. Deb and everybody has done an amazing job uh, building this out. And the fact that there's so many people here is exciting. In the middle of summer, in the middle of the week, uh, says great things for the future here. So I'm really excited to, to see what comes next. What a great event and so exciting to see this facility. I can't wait to come back, get my hands on some of those knobs and make a show. You know, at a time when uh, the print media has been on decline uh, for a number of decades, and just news media in general has been on the decline. It's really important that we continue to shine a light on the local and state level to have transparent and engaging government. And that's where people like um, the folks at FCTV come in to shine a light on transparency on government. So um, it's really important uh, uh, that they have facilities like this to help complement their work. FCTV would like to thank all the countless members, volunteers, viewers and donors that helped make this vision of a modern, state-of-the-art community media center a reality in Falmouth. We hope you'll come visit the new center, get involved, join and support us. Throughout the winter of 2019, community members spent many hours planning the relocation of the Falmouth Community Garden from the service center property to a parcel of land at Tony Andrews Farm. FCTV monitored the transition of the space from an empty field to a bountiful harvest. Hi, my name is Peter Schilling and I'm the president of the, the newly elected president of the Falmouth Community Garden Working Group. And all that means is I'm part of the group that since last year has helped make the transition from the old community garden at the service center on Gifford Street to the new garden spot where we are right now at the back of Tony Andrews Farm. And it is now, we had a, an official opening in June. It's the, now the uh, Marina Andrews Falmouth Community Garden, named after the mother of the Andrews family. And I think it's 1.3 acres that we have here. And there are, I think we have 66 plots right now and about two thirds of those are active. We didn't get it in place really until April, for sure. And you know, gardeners, you know, committed gardeners came out, and as you can see, the gardens, all these garden plots are very healthy. They're well tended. Um, one of our commitments to the Andrews uh, brothers is that we're going to keep it, you know, it neat and in good order, so it doesn't get overgrown. And you won't see anything overgrown here if you look. And people put down wood chips between the, the plots and to manage it, we have a cover crop of uh, 
buckwheat over to the right over there that was put in for some of the empty plots. There's a flower garden, you know, we have flower gardens. We actually have a way in the back where those sunflowers are, we have a, 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 a garden that's set up for pollinators that's specifically designed to attract all the, the insects that are going to pollinate the garden. So this, this area right in front is the two plots that um, uh, my fiance and I are working and we have probably 40 tomato plants with 10 different varieties of tomatoes. So, but we have peas, we have tomatoes, we have leeks, we have onions, we have cucumbers, string beans, kale, and I've got some eggplants coming, but until we make that first batch of eggplant parmesan, I can't be sure that it's been a success. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm uh, working on uh, watering my, our cherry tomatoes, which uh, have been producing great this year. I have some corn in the back, which I planted on a whim and uh, decided to plant that along with uh, beans and squash. They call that the three sisters. Yellow squash has been producing great this year. We've got more than we needed. So I'll probably reduce the number of plants next year and uh, make room for some bigger tomato plants. This is my uh, first year at Falmouth Community Gardens and uh, also my first time ever planting corn. And I, uh, I wasn't planning to. I, uh, when I was planting the tomatoes and the cucumbers in the, uh, in the plot behind us, somebody offered me corn seeds. And uh, it's been really exciting watching it grow. I've been sort of comparing it uh, week by week with the farmer's corn. I tasted the first year a couple of days ago and, uh, and it was delicious. Exciting accomplishment. This plot is going to be here basically in perpetuity. We have no lease. We're not going to get kicked off. So, so it will be here. Um, it's a great location. We have space. And this is an organic garden. That's the other thing too. Dirt, air, and water. And that's a good garden. And time. For more information about the garden, how to get your own plot, or how you can help, visit their website at falmouthcommunitygarden.org. The 300 Committee Land Trust has worked to permanently preserve and protect open space in Falmouth since 1985. Last January, FCTV took a walk through one of their most recent acquisitions, the Two Ponds Conservation Area. Hi, I'm Jessica Rittenauer. I'm the Executive Director of the 300 Committee Land Trust here in Falmouth, and we're standing at the entrance to the Two Ponds Conservation Area, 14.75 acres on Gifford Street, right next to Atria Woodbriar Place. The Two Ponds Conservation Area was donated to the 300 Committee by Atria as a condition of their development permit when they built Atria Woodbriar Place. So the land is situated between Jones Pond and Saul's Pond. So we have frontage on two ponds and when it came time for the board to decide on a name for the property, uh, naturally we settled on two ponds because that's such a significant part of the conservation value of this land and the, the vista. So this property was the Woodbriar Golf Course. It was a nine hole golf course. Uh, and at this point in time, you know, 2019, you would not recognize uh, that this was a golf course. Um, even in 2014, when the 300 committee accepted this gift of land, you could see some remnants of the tee boxes, uh, but so much has revegetated. There's an existing path that's about 400 feet long. It is handicap accessible. But one of our goals here is to get people out here to experience this land and really just take a moment to appreciate um, the beauty that we have here. Hello, I'm Alden Thomas. I am a Boy Scout from Troop 40. Uh, I am standing on the bog bridges that I made this past weekend for my Eagle Scout project. In order to obtain Eagle, I had to carry out an Eagle Scout project, which, uh, uh, which consisted of planning, organizing, and executing a project. The bog bridges help to prevent erosion and they also allow for people to enjoy the trail and beautiful scenes throughout all weathers, even when there's a few inches of extra rain from the past few weeks. The bog bridges cover a, over 100 feet of trail. Uh, they were put together by volunteers and scouts. We had over 30 participants help volunteer and over 100 hours of volunteer work. Overall, we made 13 bog bridges. 
Oh, each was eight feet long, and the wood for the bog bridges was partially donated by wood lumber. They're created with rough cut pine on the top and pressure treated six by six for the footings. At a certain time of the year, the water level is too high, so without these boards, you would not be able to walk across and walk through the whole loop. Behind me is the area where the boardwalk will actually go alongside the Cedar Swamp. It'll have an overlook platform over Jones Pond, and it'll connect to the backside to bog bridges that were created by Alden Thomas. We chose to put the boardwalk next to the Cedar Swamp because it's a really unique habitat to Cape Cod, and we wanted to bring people to be able to see the beauty of it. It's very still, quiet, dark, and it's an area where you don't find them very often, and because they're swamps, they tend to deter people, but we wanna bring people in and really show them the beauty of it. When the 300 Committee undertook this project, it was really important to us that it could be accessible by everybody. So we will have a handicap accessible path leading up to the boardwalk, and then about 360 feet of boardwalk that go over wetlands that everybody will be able to access. To make this project happen, it took coordination with Barnesville County AmeriCorps Cape Cod coming out for different work days, several volunteers from the 300 Committee's trail crew and outdoor workers, Alden Thomas and Doug Brown, a general contractor who will be building the boardwalk for us. From here, we have goals for active management of keeping out some invasives and working with a forester to have a management plan for the cedar swamp for continued stewardship of this parcel. This project is made possible through the support from the 300 Committee's membership and through a couple of our major donors in particular who, who really made significant contributions so that we could get this project going and make it happen. The trail expansion plan was completed this past fall. For more information on this and other projects, check out their website, 300committee.org. We're going to take another short break, but when we return, we'll remember a special Falmouth resident who we lost in 2019. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Adrian, president of the Rotary Club of Falmouth. You've probably seen the Rotary International Mark of Excellence wheel on road signs throughout Cape Cod and pretty much everywhere else you go. On various community project placards, during disaster relief efforts, or maybe you've noticed it on lapel pins worn by Rotarians. But do you know what it represents? What Rotary is all about? Rotary members believe that we have a shared responsibility to take action on our world's most persistent issues. Our 35,000 plus clubs work together to promote peace, fight disease, provide clean water, sanitation, and hygiene, save mothers and children, support education, and grow local economies. Rotary unites people from all continents and cultures who take action to deliver real, long-term solutions. Together, we apply our professional experience and personal commitment to find new and effective ways to enhance health, stability, and prosperity across the globe. Through volunteering, our 1.2 million members make lifelong friendships that transcend political and cultural boundaries and foster global understanding and respect. As people of action, we share a strong sense of purpose. More than a century ago, Rotary pioneered a new model of service leadership grounded in person-to-person -person connections. Today, those connections are a network that spans the globe, bridging cultural, linguistic, generational, and geographic barriers, and shares the vision of a better world. Why do Rotarians achieve so much? We invest in relationships. We make decisions grounded in evidence. We know how to mobilize our networks to create solutions that last. And we're always learning from our experiences in projects, clubs, and careers. We know that our capacity to make a difference is larger when more people unite with us. Rotary brings together the kind of people who step forward to take on important issues for local communities worldwide. Rotary members hail from a wide range of professional backgrounds, teachers, lawyers, social workers, small business owners, artists, doctors, and writers all call themselves Rotarians. Rotary connects these unique perspectives and helps leverage its members' expertise to improve lives everywhere. The Rotary Club of Falmouth invites you to join Rotary's 1.2 million neighbors, friends, leaders, and problem solvers 
who see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and in ourselves. Visit us at falmouthrotary.com to learn how you can get involved. Welcome back to our Year in Review special. Almost one year ago, Falmouth was saddened to learn that Tommy Leonard, founder of the Falmouth Road Race and Falmouth Walk, had passed away at the JML Care Center. We spoke with several people who knew him for years about his vision, passion, and generosity. Let's hear it for Tommy Leonard celebrated his 81st birthday just a couple of days ago. And thanks to Tommy and a bunch of friends, this race is going on. I answered a job at a club in uh, Cambridge and Tommy happened to be working a little private bar of this club. They played, they were an old banjo club that switched to rock and roll. And I got more of a kick out of going in there watching and listening to him than I did listening to the rock and roll music. Yeah, he used to talk about Falmouth all the time. Oh, the beautiful sunsets uh, over the bay and tangerine sunsets. And uh, we used to go to the quarter deck for a uh, libation or two. Well, at first, uh, I'd like to say that my wife and I are newcomers to the Tommy Leonard experience. Uh, I've only known him for 25 years. My wife's parents lived here in Falmouth. So we'd come down here on weekends and we'd do the Falmouth Track Club, had a Friday night run, and then afterwards everybody would go in the quarter deck and have a beverage. And of course, that's where we met Tommy. Our, our plan in 1998 was to move down here in seven years, but we only made it two years because we knew more people here part-time because of him than we did back in our hometown. I ran high school uh, track and cross country, and um, I got the chance to meet Tommy. Um, and meeting Tommy back then was a, was a big deal, um, not unlike today. Just for a brief moment I met him, in, got introduced, told him I ran you know, high school track and cross country, and um, it was a pleasure meeting him. Well, I didn't see him again until the following summer. And as soon as he saw me, he remembered my name. He had read about races that I had run, knew the times I had run, and just made me feel unbelievable. I met Tommy Leonard in the spring of 1973. I'm in my office one day, and in walks this gentleman, walks briskly across the lobby, comes to my office, knocks, says, hello, are you Rich Sherman? I said, yes, sir. I'm Tommy Leonard. I heard you're a runner. I heard you're a Navy man. I said, that's correct on both counts. Well, I was a Marine, so you used to drive the boats for us, and we appreciated that. I'm starting up a road race. I understand you just ran Boston this spring, and I'd like to know if you would help me organize a little run on my birthday from one bar to another. I said, it's a recreation event. I'll help with any recreation event that benefits our community. Count me in. He would brag about that road race to get more people to run in it. He was always promoting Falmouth. He was the guy who recruited elite athletes. Any runner that was ever a runner in New England during the running boom in the 70s and 80s, if they came anywhere near the Cape, they had to stop in Falmouth to see Tommy Leonard. 20, almost 29 years ago, we put our heads together after a ride down and, and said, you know, we could do an event the day before because there's so many people that have family and friends that come down with them. We could have an event for them. He always wanted it to be 400 walkers, no more. He never wanted it to get too big because he wanted his Norman Rockwell moment. This year we hit 775. He still wants to keep it at 400, but when he heard 775, holy cow. <laughs> so that's just the, the attitude and the atmosphere that he created. We've raised, uh, I think the last three years, over $40,000. It's pretty special. I think Tommy's lasting memory is his um, his giving spirit. I mean, that is what started the Falmouth Road Race, where the road race now is giving back to so many different charities. And that's why he started the walk. He wanted to give back. He'd give you the shirt, he'd give you the pants and everything off his body. Just an upbeat, positive, happy person. Um, he's just somebody that we're all gonna, we're, we're gonna miss. We're gonna miss him deeply. He w always wanted to help people, give back, and I know that spirit will never die. And he was like Johnny Appleseed, spreading goodwill, goodwill and happiness wherever he went. 
He'd walk into a bar and not know a damn person. And by the time he left, he was a regular customer. And I'll miss him, uh, miss him dearly. Good friend. Tommy Leonard was 85. We will remember Tommy as a local legend who never stopped giving and caring. He made Falmouth a better place. Throughout 2019, the Cape Cod Curling Club celebrated their 50th anniversary and invited members throughout the past half century to an anniversary dinner at the club back in February. Curling Club was started by Dave DeWeese, who was a doctor. He and was, his wife. And his wife, Anne. He was visiting a curling club in Boston and saw it and thought it was a good idea to try it down here and put a notice in the paper, anybody interested, and there were about eight people who responded and started the nucleus of the club. But they curled at the ice arena and they agreed that they would <coughs> put in the houses and set up a place for us to curl Tuesday nights from 9 to 11. So that's how we got started. So we curled at the arena for a couple of years and um, that, uh, then they needed the ice for hockey. I, ice hockey was very, very, very um, popular at that time so they couldn't really continue to let us use the ice. So we were left without ice and then we had a decision to make as to what we would do and things that we had, we had no knowledge of because neither Dave nor I knew anything about curling when we started. And so, um, so we were able to secure ice time at Brayburn Country Club uh, every other Sunday. And that held the, held the group together. And so in 1970, we began a fundraising effort in 1973-ish, 4 -ish. And, um, and then um, in 1975, March of 1975, the facility was finished and that's when we came here. And it was just half the size. We have uh, watched this grow and it's been just beautiful. It's been beautiful to watch and have the people come in and work so hard. It's amazing to think that we're at 50 years when those first five or seven or eight years, we wondered if we would be able to stay alive. And then in 1998, the first Olympic curling came in uh, Nagano and um, Japan and um, that was somewhat helpful but but the following time that the Winter Olympics came it was really much much better and it became it became a very flourishing club at that time as many others did. That was the big thing that really helped us. Well, we got a good surge right then plus not only members, but knowledge around the community. Prior to that, if you went to the Chamber of Commerce and asked where the curling club was, they said, what? What's a curling club? It's, it's been a great, a great time for me. And my husband, uh, he lived to see this edition put on and to see wheelchair curling. And so I'm very gratified by that because uh, it, was, it was his little idea. <laughs> the Curling Club has begun its 51st year of operation, and new members are always welcome. Check out their website at capecodcurling.org. We'll be right back with more of our favorite stories from last year. Stay with us.
Welcome back. Visionary sculptor Patrick Daugherty has crafted his unique sculptures made of sticks and saplings around the world. In 2019, he was commissioned to build one of his installations on the lawn of historic Highfield Hall. With the help of dozens of local volunteers, he completed the work in June. Yeah, my name is Patrick Daugherty. I live in uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I'm a sculptor. Uh, well, uh, you know, I'm an artist for hire. So someone in Highfield had seen some work, maybe at the Peabody Essex or uh, Tower Hill Botanic Garden or some other where some other place that's nearby. So that that set them up to uh, invite me to come here, and uh, I made a site visit uh, a year ago, and we looked at the place and decided how we could best um, spring a sculpture into their site and uh, see what we could do. I feel how we ordered material from upstate New York from a willow farm that grows it and where some of the primary users of that material they line it out like a crop. They cut it and then it comes back up uh, from the same stump. So it's a quite efficient and economical, but it's also a bit environmentally friendly. They're growing it as a crop and they, it renews itself all the time. It's very esoteric, but we were looking at leaf patterns and the veins on the back of leaves. And, and in a way, they're kind of little, like, little supply lines. Immediately, I realized that that was going to be such a big piece if we tried to uh, use that as a model that uh, kind of abstracted the idea and made a Florida Lee, took and made a little drawing, laid that drawing out on the lawn, uh, scaled it and laid it out, and then uh, we tended to go along and make holes along the perimeter, put these bigger sapling pieces down in there, bend those over into the shape we wanted. So um, we have a kind of a central wall that runs uh, that's about 17 feet high, and then we have these little curlicues that branch off of that and make like seven little uh, bivouacs, like little cabanas, little roofless uh, places, a uh, kind of simple shelter and uh, the top is enlivened with a kind of a piping, a, a rolled uh, look that you might put along, see along the edge of your couch cushion. And that allows it to be unified. There's a unifying factor there. So when you look at it from, a, from the house here, uh, you look down and you see a kind of a flowing line that moves along the entire of uh, the piece. And so there's a huge unifying effect in that. I have to say that people have been very kind to me here. I've really enjoyed my time. And uh, in Falmouth, we've uh, had several people. Uh, uh, the bagel shop, uh, Cape Cod Bagel, has provided our lunches, which has been great. And we've had some other, uh, George Chapman, who is uh, a local gardener and has a, has a beautiful garden. He was our volunteer coordinator, started out that way, but then ending, ended up giving us his talent by working really hard on the sculpture himself. He's done a lot of, of windows and doors in the sculpture and uh, he should be, uh, you know, we're really proud to have had him. I do love what I do. I, I have been working at it a long time and, uh, you know, there's the uh, rubric of, of working with sticks, but, uh, and it's, that's a, the same boring aspect of, that everybody had, faces in their job, but then there are all the people that you meet and so that enlivens the situation. and. There's a kind of responsibility to the publics and various places to try to do a, a great work, one that has some energy in it and some excitement and that causes the uh, public to come running. Here at, in Falmouth at uh, Highfield Hall, uh, we've been, uh, every, about every five minutes, somebody yells, oh wow, that's the greatest thing I've ever seen. So in terms of, uh, you know, the reception for sculpture, you know, it can't be better than that. A passing fancy is still on display at Highfield for Falmouth visitors and residents alike. Improving the water quality in Little Pond has been a challenge that the town of Falmouth has been addressing using various strategies during the past several years. Placing shellfish in the pond has proven to be a successful method, and FCTV was there in July as volunteers, students, and town staff deployed oysters from the Falmouth Inner Harbor to Little Pond where they will continue to grow. We're 
placing shellfish in Little Pond here, which is located on the other side of Bristol Beach, because we want to improve the water quality in Little Pond, which we've already done over the last uh, number of years through the use of shellfish. So we will set up stations like we did last week to fill the bags. There's only today about 240, 250 bags we want to get out. Last week we, we pushed, I think, over what, four, what we do, about 400 last week. A lot of our work is done with volunteers, students, members of the community who just come out and love to be involved. We, we work real closely with these different groups and we're so fortunate to have all of them. They give you a lot of education and, and you're growing. And, you know, regardless of your age, you have to grow. And you work with young people, you tend to be more vibrant and, and enjoy life a little bit as far as I'm concerned. in the bucket. Those can go right in here. There you are. Thank you very much. So what we're doing right now is we're getting the associated weights with each upweller uh, so that we know exactly where to stock them at, what weights to stock them at. We're trying to stock them at a density of 400 per bag. And so what we do is we go in and we take individual samples from each upweller and then weigh those individual samples. Um, so the known weights are then calculated, so we're able to go ahead and distribute into each bag that appropriate weight. So we're going to stock this at a density of 276. So we got a good, good measurement there. Next thing we're going to do is start to remove these silos. Today we have an impressive volunteer crew as well as our crew of student interns and seasonal staff members. We are deploying our first year oysters that have been growing in Falmouth Inner Harbor <laughs> since okay. about mid-June. How many buckets should we put in each tub? Like four? Yeah. Just so they're not too heavy, guys. We are staging our bags here. They're going to go out to our little pond farm right in the water right offshore where they will sit in our floating oyster bags until about mid-October. We are weighing about 400 animals out per bag to control our stocking densities to make sure our bags roughly have about the same number of animals. This makes it a little bit easier on the other end when we go to move our animals out. It keeps our bags from getting too heavy and it keeps our animals growing beautifully. We're going to need two runners. We need two people filling right here. You're going to be going this way. We'll go through your function in a minute. We're going to need a second person for putting tops on. Bernie, do you want to be a runner? Want to be a filler? Brendan, you want to be a runner on this side? You're going to work your way down. You want to start right over here. You're going to be going this way. Do you want to do it? Okay, come on over. And I'm going to show you what we're looking for here. 276 is roughly going to look like this. My husband and I decided to volunteer for the Shellfish Commission because we went to the McCoy open house and we learned all about oystering. And they were so welcoming and there was a lot of volunteer opportunities and I thought this is something my husband and I could do together. This is one of the only nitrogen solution problems that actually provides a benefit beyond just hard sewering. If you think of what it costs to put in one sewer, with that amount of money we can grow millions of pieces of shellfish which go out into the wild resource. We weigh all the shellfish when we're done in Little Pond and then move them to a secondary location, uh, either in East Falmouth or West Falmouth, where the animals continue to grow. They are weighed again at the end of their secondary growing period and then the animals are put out for harvest in East Falmouth or West Falmouth. People ask, if you can't shellfish in Little Pond, you know, how can you eat the shellfish afterward if they're in another pond? So those animals, have the ability to match the water quality. So if we replace them into a water body which meets the state and local standards to be open to shellfishing, uh, then the shellfish that are put in there in rapid time go ahead and uh, assume that water quality uh, that is in that pond. So at the end of it, uh, if you're a resident, you can purchase a, a shellfish license. They, if you're a senior, you can purchase a license for $6 and literally get oysters well through Christmas. I shellfish and this time of year I get uh, mostly quahogs and uh, I can get uh, steamer clams once in a while. And in the fall and winter time it's a basic oysters. For more information on the shellfish program, 
check out the Falmouth Department of Marine and Environmental Services Facebook page. And that does it for this special edition of Falmouth in Focus. All of us here at FCTV hope that you've enjoyed this year-end special, and we look forward to bringing you more hyperlocal stories in 2020. Stay tuned for our 100th episode special later in January. We leave you now with some of the beautiful photos sent to us from viewers like you via our two hashtags, MyFalmouth and Falmouth in Focus. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.